Would you like to learn about large language models and small language models and when you should consider a large language model versus a small language model? If so, this video is for you. Hi, my name is Michael Gibbs and I'm the founder and CEO of GoCloud Careers. And I've been an architect now for about 25 years. Network, architect, enterprise architect, business architect, you name it. I've loved all these roles. I am joined here by David Lithicum, who is an expert in AI architectures and cloud architectures. And he's beat me with his 35 years of experience in architecture. And uh, because he's an expert on AI and generative AI architectures, he's going to answer some questions today. David, how are you today? I'm doing great. Love to talk about small language models and large language models. Wonderful. So can you first define what is a small language model and then a large language model? And then we'll talk about how they work and then we when we should use each one. Yeah, let's start with large language models. So the best example of a large language model, we all know it with ChatGPT, uh, Gemini, you know, other systems out there that are built with the holistic knowledge of the entire Internet. So they decided to just like we we go through in Google stuff. Instead of doing that, they basically created a knowledge base based on everything that can be found that's accessible uh, via the open internet, even some archival stuff and books. And it basically brings everything and anything into, into its knowledge base. That's why it's called a large language model. We have a, a whole, pref, uh, whole uh, array of things that uh, we understand and that becomes part of our knowledge base. You know, For example, if you got to chat GPT and I can, you know, send out a note about something I know I wrote about in the book back in the 90s, it'll come up as a response. That's because it learned from my book, which is accessible via the internet, uh, like a lot of old books are. And that's how we build it. So the thing is, the great thing about large language models, they're able to deal with complexity and make it simple. They're able to deal with complex topics and boil it down to our ability to ask a question. One of the reasons and the power we use in LLM, like ChatGPT and others, is because we can ask it a question that we could certainly find ourselves. We can sit down with Google and do our own research to figure things out. Um, but it's able to use the LLM because it's built into the knowledge base and find the response to the patterns that you're looking for specifically. So that's why we can ask it anything, ask it about ourselves. And also since it's generative AI, we're able to generate the response in a way in which is things that are more usable to us, we can ask it to generate a spreadsheet or ask it to generate code to create a web page based on the response that you came back. So it just has a, a whole bunch of very impressive features, which is one of the uh, one of the reasons that everybody fell in love with generative AI when ChatGPT and other uh, generative systems started to emerge. Um, the downside of these things is they're very expensive to train. Uh, my understanding is ChatGPT takes 12 days and $12 million of resources to train it uh, because it's an awful lot of information, basically every piece of information that's out there and the whole version of the internet. Um, and so, and they're going to have very uh, open and unlimited use cases. So in other words, a complete flexibility, we can use any number of ways. Uh, and that's why LLMs are so handy to us, but we normally leverage LLMs as a service because these things are huge and they're very difficult for companies to afford how to build a version of them themselves and they don't have any specific or narrow purpose. Small language models are basically going to be um, like large language models, but they're built with limited data. In other words, they're built around a particular task. So a small language model associated with supply chain would be dealing with logistics information is related to inventory information is related to weather information is related to shipping cost information just around the particular domain of supply chain integration. Normally these things are very easy to train. They, they'll train le less than an hour and they cost less than hundred dollars to train very tactical uses of the system, but we have the same advantages. Obviously we can't ask everything uh, that we can ask chat GPT, but for our particular use case, our tactical use case, uh, supply chain integration, we can ask lots of things that are more valuable to us. In other words, uh, for this particular product number, how is it more optimized way to ship it, you know, based on past behaviors, past efficiencies, including picking the right vendors to make it happen. So it's able to respond to stuff like that. So the great thing about small language models is number one, they're fairly cost effective. Obviously they're limited in scope. Um, 
people can build them fairly quickly. These projects to build small language model uh, based uh, uh, applications uh, can take between three months to six months to build from the architecture to the deployment. They're not very expensive to build. And since they're tactically focused at solving a particular problem, business can see the value of them fairly quickly. Normally, they can figure out, they can figure, uh, get the ROI of these things in less than a couple of months after they're deployed. So they all have their purpose. And the focus seems to be on small language models because people are realizing that they, they can't build an LLM or they shouldn't build an LLM. You can certainly they use ChatGPT, Gemini, and other LLMs as a service. Um, but in building these more tactical use cases for generative AI systems, you're going to be able to get to value quicker. And so that's why the initial foray into the businesses are doing right now and finding the use cases are building small language models because it's a limited use of data, a very narrow scope, very tactical use case, and the ability to focus on a single problem domain versus every problem out there, which is what large language models attempt to do. But you can still have access to the large language models in the back end system. You're not giving that up. You can still get at ChatGPT through an API call for almost free. And you're able to augment those systems directly into your utilization of small language models. We're able to keep our own domain with our own data that's specialized for us that ChatGP knows nothing about because ChatGP doesn't have access to our data, our databases and our data to train itself and able to build a knowledge base around that for the tactical use case. And then we can go out to large language models to, you know, figure out logistics information, you know, mapping optimization, um, all these sorts of things that those things are able to do. So the ability to use a tiered based system where you use small language models for our own purposes, for our own data, our own knowledge base, and we can go to back end systems, back end LLMs when we need them. It's the best of both worlds. And that's where probably 80 to 90% of the development is occurring right now. And that makes total sense. But let's um, the question I have about an LLM versus a small language model, let's talk about accuracy. And, and here's the reason I'm asking the question. You just mentioned that ChatGPT, for example, is the entire internet. The entire internet includes sources like Reddit, personal people, social media posts, scraping off of everybody's blog and website. Now, let's say I need it to work and I wanted to train a model on for physicians and I picked the thousand most recognized medical textbooks in history and I trained it with a sporadic number of lectures from the world's greatest medical schools. Now I'm training it on really accurate data peer-reviewed data, data that was chosen versus whomever that thought they knew something about healthcare. Is my accuracy going to be better? Your, it, your accuracy is going to be dependent on the data that you train it upon. So the more accurate your data is, the, the better your systems are going to, your better your systems are going to be. Um, yeah. I, and I get where you're going at. I mean, it's funny. It's like ChatGPT until recently uh, listed me as going to MIT. Um, Good, good mistake for it to make, but it wasn't accurate based on that. And it made uh, some bad calls based on the fact it was taking huge amounts of data with different degrees of accuracy, different degrees of, uh, of hygiene associated with the data. So the more accurate the data, and typically the smaller the database, uh, that you're, uh, the smaller the amount of data you're training upon, the more likelihood you are to have an accurate result from that. Less hallucinations, more accurate, accurate to, the, to the point information that actually need. Yeah, and you know that to me looks very attractive because if I'm trying to create something that does a really good job, I want it to have really good data. And you know, I remember I come from a medical perspective. I mean, I've been an architect for 25 years, but I think the lessons I learned there really changed my life as an architect. You know, when the internet had just come out when I was in school, and they were like, "Well, you can go to this site or this site, but not these sites because these sites are made by non-medical people." And it was true, the information that somebody got sick and they had an experience, maybe it worked for them, but it might not work for the rest of the medical population. So we had to look for legitimate sources of data. That was our source of truth. And if we go to AI, you know, if we've got better data that, and the data is the source of truth, we're gonna have better results. So, you know, maybe what you're describing that small language model and that large language model is not only cheaper, but maybe it's the perfect solution because maybe we can use very accurately trained models specific to our business and still leverage those large language models for things that are outside of our domain that can still be helpful.
Absolutely. And also small language models, you can leverage them as bunches of things. And you can certainly leverage them through agentic capabilities, turning them into AI agents where they're having certain personas and able to carry out certain operations, either as a single agent or a group of agents. So it provides you with more flexibility because normally we're not just going to build a single small language model. We're going to be multiple, build multiple small language models. They're going to be contained in agents or their own monolithic systems are able to carry out a purpose and also have these things work together to come up with better results. So, and that's within our domain, our business domain, and they're just associated with the business. Large language models are associated with everything. Uh, so we need to get accurate information around what we're doing. We can control the data that's training the small language models and therefore determine the accuracy of the, uh, the, knowledge, uh, the knowledge responses that come from the inference engines that are using those small language models. But, you know, people, you know, realize they go, well, I'm looking for something a little bit more holistically so I can build this uh, AI system for an entire bank. You can certainly do that, but just do so incrementally. So in other words, you build something for your back end operations, build stuff for your front end operations, build stuff for your customer, uh, customer relationship, customer, um, customer management, customer experience systems. All these sorts of things can take place and you build them to solve a little problem, build them to solve a little problem. And there's no reason, kind of unlike the way we did applications in the last 30 years, instead of having them sit in their own silos <clears throat> with their own data, you have them communicating one to another and have common mechanisms so they're able to sh exchange information, validate each other's uh, uh, conclusions. And it really allows you to build something which everybody was trying to get to, like an LLM for a bank or an LLM for a retail organization, to providing you with a much stronger, much larger use case for a particular usage of AI, in this case, generative AI, that's going to work for your business. And it's built through the automation and building up of the automation. So we have to build things in increments. Businesses are very bad at building these multi-year projects when they're going to build something over a two to three year period of time and spend many millions of dollars as soon as there's a downturn in the business, which always occur, they'll abandon the project and suddenly that money that was invested has gone to waste. So if you build things incrementally, build a small language model, a small language model, a small language model, a small language model, you're gonna get to a certain point where in essence, you have a de facto large language model for your particular business because all these things are working together and bringing things together. They're certainly not a chat GPT and they're not trying to be, but your ability to get a level of automation, level of knowledge and understanding that's gonna be whole to your entirety of your business and the ability to return more value back to the business and have these things able to play off each other as a one plus one equals two, uh, three scenario is where we're looking to go. And that's the best path to make that happen. I tell people who are looking to use AI all the time, get small wins, small battles are gonna win the war. You know, this is not a, a big, large, you know, swing for the fences kind of thing, which I think people saw two years ago. This is about tactical things that are affordable, getting things done and then building on the successes. Yeah, and I think that's the mistake. You know, we're all excited by what AI can do. But if we don't know which problem we're trying to solve, we end up solving nothing and getting nothing out of it in the first place. You know, and the first AI system I worked on was, I think it was 2001. It was a bank that had an algorithmic trading system. And that was great. And then the next system they were thinking about is something that they could actually use in customer service for people when they would call. And, you know, we're getting back to that place where you know, let's design the systems for exactly what we need them to do. And in the end, you know, the, the sum, as you said, is greater than each part. But more, more importantly, it's going to work. It's going to do for the business what it needs. We can demonstrate that ROI and we can say, well, you've invested $5 million here, but you got $30 million in business value. So let's try it here as well. And so see if we can get you there. And in the end, there will be a lot more AI, but at least it's going to be there for the right reason. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I and mean, we're going to get to, you know, task specific, uh, uh, specificity, you know, they're designed for a particular task they're able to do cost and energy efficiency. We're not building these things with GPUs every, every time. I just, I forgot to mention that earlier, but that's a benefit of small language models. We don't have to use a hundred GPUs in series to build these things, which costs, you know, a huge amount of money. Are we use, you know, getting these monster tax uh, cloud bills that are coming back because they're using expensive processing on AWS, Microsoft, or Google. Uh, and also with the deployment flexibility, we're able again, put these in agents, we're able to put these in applications, we're able to put these on devices, uh, don't necessarily have the overhead that comes with building LLMs or even building, you know, LLMs that maybe try to scale down for the business. So, um, 
when I you do the math with with everybody who wanted to build an LLM two years ago, and it says, okay, every if we're looking to do that, we're going to need the power generating on the planet times four. We're never going to get yeah. there. The grids can't afford it. We're not going to be able to build these data centers and build these power plants. I understand you want to do this, but there's a reality in how you're able to do this. And I think that this is, in essence, the ability to do, and I, and I call this, have a name for it, I call it lean AI. Your ability to do lean AI, which is going to provide you with more a better value proposition, more tactical use case, your ability to get to value from it faster. And, and it's funny, I think businesses really didn't take a lot of convincing to come around to this. Uh, and they just did a study, some CIOs were were studied, they were having problems finding the use cases for generative AI because they couldn't find the use case in the business. When suddenly we started presenting small language models as a technical alternative, suddenly the use cases started to appear. Supply chain integration, inventory management, customer relationship management, uh, and you know, in healthcare, patient management, diagnostic systems, uh, the P things that are bound to devices and imaging systems, things like that. We're always there. It's just people were trying to make these things overly complex. And when we look at small language models, what we're doing is we're looking at things in more tactical, bite-sized way. And we're able to solve these things in series, getting a little better, getting a little better, getting a little better, where suddenly we have the utilization of AI, which is able to truly bring a massive amounts of value back to the business. And I think that Businesses that see this as a key differentiator and use this as an innovative differentiator are the ones that are going to be be um, the superstars of the future. You know, they're going to be the Netflix and they're going to be the Ubers and they're going to be the Airbnbs and, uh, you know, whatever you value those companies. But taking their business models to the next level, whether it's a pharmaceutical company, you know, whether it's a uh, manufacturer, you know, whether it's a tire plant, but their ability to automate these things where they're getting to almost perfect information, they're making perfect decisions based on the perfect information, able to do that in real time, able to automate and make things very autonomous in the systems, able to optimize their manufacturing process or whatever they're doing, the services they're providing, able to provide an enhanced customer experience that no one else can replicate. Those are the ones that are gonna play the game, right? Those are the ones that are gonna win. And so those are the ones that are gonna be able to use generative AI in a way that's specifically valuable to them. And for the most cases, that's gonna be small language models. Yeah, and that's the key. I mean, if we're Microsoft, I can see it because they're becoming an AI company and hence they just started they purchasing a nuclear power plant and they're restarting it because they need it for them. <laughs> but, you know, that's a company with a quarter of a million employees and all they do is next generation technology and enterprise technology, so I get it. but. The average hospital doesn't need to do that. The average retailer doesn't need to do that. Most businesses don't need to go down that path because it's not their business. AI is a tool to augment their business. AI is not their business. Yeah, I mean, IT should always be considered as something that is um, a means to the end. It means to value. Yeah. It's not uh, It's not value unto itself. And, I, and as, an, as a lifelong IT person, you know, you know, how dare I say that, but I, the close, the quicker you come to that conclusion, the more you realize that you're there to generate business value and to build systems that are going to optimize the business. And that's what we do as architects. We look at that all the time. It's not necessarily representing technology for technology's sake or the ability to run after whatever shiny object is in front of us now, either cloud, generative AI, you know, what have you, things that pop up on the radar screen is technology that all the cool kids are using. But the ability to get to the right solution, apply the right solution is something that's going to really kind of take the business to a level that it needs to be taken to. And the quicker we come to that reality, and I think people are coming to that reality now, I think the more we're going to focus on building the things that are important to the business. And if we build things that are important to the business, we're going to get to a better optimized state where the businesses are able to um, uh, optimize their utilization of resources, able to burn less power, able to run, run logistic systems that are much more much more effective, and that is going to be returned directly back to the consumer. So we should get cheaper things out of it. We should have better experiences. We should be able to do things in ways um, they are gonna be much more enjoyable now than uh, having a lot of wasted motion. And I think that the quicker we get to that, the better off everybody's going to be, and certainly the better that business is going to be. And this should be a number one priority right now in these organizations is how do we get to that state? How do we get to the real-time enterprise? How do we get to the knowledge-based enterprise? 
where we're able to leverage not our own knowledge, our own data as a true force multiplier that's going to take our business to the next level. I'm not saying leverage other people's data yep. and hitting chat GPT all the time. I'm saying just take the data you have, the stuff that's contained in silos, learn from that data and the ability to weaponize that data in a way that's going to um, accelerate the value that's going to be able to come down. And here we are in 2025, and a lot of businesses can't do that yet. In other words, they don't know what their data is. They know what it means. They know how to use it correctly. So let's get into incremental problem solving. Let's solve little mini problems that we know need to be solved using the technology that's able to bring, bring the value back. AI is just enabling technology. That's going to change over time. But the ability to take our data, pull it out of the silo, put it into a format, put it into a, a usability bucket that's going to make most sense to us that is going to maximize the value we're able to get from the data that's going to be everything to us we've been trying to get value out of our data for the last 30 years and we've actually made things worse things are more heterogeneous more complex we have more data silos these things are integrated one to another uh you know heck i wrote a book about you know in the 90s and how to how to make all these stuff work and play well together and largely it's gotten worse well now we have an opportunity to leverage that data as something that can train a system, which is gonna be able to find the data we need to make the data more usable than we need and to use the data in something that's gonna have a better business benefit. So let's do it. We have the opportunity now, we have the technology, it's fairly cheap. Um, you know, Let's build the skill sets we need, let's do the planning we need, and let's take our businesses to the next level. Total agreement with you. Now it's time to actually get a return on investment for these businesses that are playing it. And we can do it too. And the AI and generative AI provide some incredible tools to do so. David, thank you for sharing your AI expertise with our audience. If you are looking for an AI career as an AI architect, uh, check out the free ebook and the webinar we have in the description of this video. On that webinar, David and I will go over the AI architect role, what we do, and we'll answer any questions. And of course, that article, that ebook that we're talking about was also written by David and I. If you've got a goal for enterprise architect careers, cloud architect careers, security architect careers, we've got free webinars and free guides to assist you in those careers as well. Uh, look for the description in the description of this video and uh, hope we get to meet you on a free uh, webinar where it'll be on Zoom. We can answer your questions and truly help you get to your goal. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like. Please subscribe to the channel, our channel, and hit the bell to be notified of new videos to help you with your cloud computing or your AI architect or your security architect or enterprise architect career. Uh, thank you all for now. We'll see you on another video.